the Radio Wemo Breakfast. The G- Geek Show. He's joining us from thegeekshow.com. Two threes rather than two e's. It is uh, Calvin joining us. Hello to you, Calvin. Hello, good morning. Very good. Um, uh, good, good, good morning to you. Now, um... A few weeks ago, we, we, we did a wee introduction to nanotechnology and some of the innovations that are going on around the world. But um, since then, I mean, it's a fast-moving area of science, isn't it? So there's a whole lot of other things. Yeah, to be honest, I could do this show on a weekly basis yeah. and, and do nothing but uh, nanotech. And every week I'd have news. Anything, anything can be arranged, Kelvin. <laughs> we can make this work. My people talk to your people. Oh, have I just taught myself into something <laughs> bad there? I'd better pull out of this quickly. Anyway, I'd better get moving because there's heaps of news here. Okay. Um, I've tried to cluster this all together um, because a lot of these come from different labs, but I think you'll see how they all fit together. First of all, there's a study um, from the American Chemical Society. Victor Aristov and colleagues have um, been, uh, they've just released a paper. Uh, describing growing high-quality graphene on the surface of commercially available silicon carbide wafers. What's graphene? Graphene is single sheets of carbon molecules. It's what graphite's made out of right. in your, in your um, the tips of your pencils, uh, you know, the, the leads in, in pencils. And um, previously, the first way they found of getting graphene was actually using um, sellotape and pencils. Huh. Seriously. What, what, just like, put, uh, cells uh, having, the, and then taking it off, and then you get a nice and then little you layer. And a single molecular layer of graphene. Oh, wow. So graphene That's high tech. Very interesting stuff, but yeah. now that uh, they've worked out um, how to grow it on silicon carbide wafers, this represents a step forward towards um, mass industrial mass production of graphene, uh, which is just fantastic because some of the things that graphene can be used for comes on to my next story. Yeah. Uh, this is out of uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards of Technology in the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and their findings suggest that if you stack graphene layers, there's the potential to safely store hydrogen uh, in between the layers. Really? Yes. Um, now, this would be oxidized graphene sheets stacked atop of one another like decks of a, a parking lot, connected by molecules that link both the layers and maintain space between them. Yeah. So this graphene oxide framework could accumulate hydrogen quite safely um, in a way that gets rid of an awful lot of the problems of moving hydrogen around were we to start trying to move to a hydrogen economy. So this could be used um, potentially for uh, for cars? Yes, for cars and for fuel cells and okay. stuff like that, yeah. So that's, that's another big breakthrough. And um, the other thing connected to this in, you know, uh, well, connected directly through to the um, car thing and the hydrogen thing is there's uh, some novel strategies for um, engineering semiconductor materials that basically boost the performance of water-splitting solar cells. So direct solar onto effectively, you know, inorganic metal substrates that have got complex structure on them that produces hydrogen. So uh, this is worked by, um, out of the laboratory of Jin Zhang yep. uh, at UCSC. Um, him and a couple of his lab students have just released a paper on that uh, showing huge performance um, gains to be made in photoelectrochemical cells, which are ones that take sunlight and split water into something, as well as this could also increase the performance of traditional photovoltaic cells. So, uh, And this, this, this all helps with, with alternative energy sources? Yeah. Mm. I mean, this, this is a way potentially of getting um, hydrogen close to where you need it rather than having to make it somewhere and then ship it. Right. Or to use energy from, say, coal or nuclear to create hydrogen, which you then have to attempt to ship around the country. Because that's the big problem with it at the moment, isn't yeah, it? Well, you have to use fossil fuels to make it. And, and also, you can't really um, stick hydrogen in a, in a fuel tanker and expect to take it from A to B with ease. It leaks out from everything. It just, it just moves through substances. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's terrible to, to transport. Yeah. So those three relate quite nicely and all, all interconnect. Uh, 
four good stories on battery technology. Once again, this all kind of has a lot of bearing on, um, you know, people's use of laptops and the potential for electric vehicles. But uh, some Japanese scientists have invented a printable lithium battery. <sighs> wow. Um, just using current printing technologies, this is a project being carried out at the Advanced Materials Innovation Center, um, which uh, belongs to an, uh, an incorporated foundation called the My Industry and Enterprise Support Center. It's a lithium polymer battery, and it's flexible, so it's designed for flexible solar batteries and displays or attachment to curved surfaces, uh, and it's um, around 500 micrometers thick, or more to the point, 500 micrometers thin. So it's um, tiny. Yeah, but has an increased surface area compared with other batteries, so it can be layered up, it can be produced cheaply, it's rechargeable, and can be laminated. So it'll be like, honey, the remote doesn't work anymore, no worries, dear, I'm printing a new battery. Yeah, pretty much. Potential for that? Uh, if our printers at home get as good as their printers, yes, mm. and I don't see any reason why they shouldn't. Yeah. So uh, they've they produced prototypes outputting at 2 volts and 4 volts, and um, the research project ends in March next year, and then they're continuing work improving manufacturing technologies to make it suitable for commercial production. Cool. So we're probably expecting maybe two years for that um, to start slipping out. Uh, researchers from Mississippi State University have developed a potentially new charging method now, this is just in, uh, appears to be just a paper describing the maths all works. But basically, they've simulated the lithium ion battery charging process um, in different ways, and it looks like they've worked out new charging methods that could vastly reduce battery recharge times. Hmm. So, this isn't physically proven, but it's all mathematically proven at the moment. So. Whenever you're thinking about battery recharge times in the future, just remember that there are things in the labs just, you know, just around the corner that are going to knock all these charging times right down. Yeah, it's great that they're able to sort of jot this stuff down in theory using maths, first of all, before they invest so much money in, in the development. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it's amazing, isn't it, in very much the way our brains allowed us to simulate what, what might happen if we throw a rock yeah. and gain us a, a huge advantage over other animals. Yeah. Our computers are allowing us to simulate all of this stuff without it taking time and, and resources. So uh, next one is um, some next-generation lithium-ion batteries um, being developed by Hitachi, Maxell, and also Panasonic has got some stuff that's going to be coming out next year. Um, these are a bit, these are lithium ion batteries using uh, silicon alloy anodes, uh, anodes instead of graphite. Um, and they're looking at performance increases. Well, the, fir the first test batteries they've got out are 30% better in terms of storage than the current ones. Yeah. So that's a 30% increase within the year. Cool. Um, and that's, that should all be happening at the moment. Uh, but what's very interesting is some people, uh, Bruno, let's see if I can get this right, Scrosati and Yusef Hassoun at the University of Rome, um, are getting around the, the technical issues with uh, lithium sulfur batteries. Now, lithium sulfur batteries uh, deliver much more energy by mass than conven conventional lithium ion batteries. But... Um, normally you can't make them because the electrodes slowly dissolve. Right. And they also involve lithium metal rather than lithium ions. And lithium metal can form dendritic deposits, uh, little whiskers that cause short circuits. Short circuit in a battery like that equals explosion. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> Catastrophic. So, yes. But what they've managed to do is um, create a, a process which sort of binds up all the different bits of this electrochemical process. So things are split in, in careful ways. Uh, the cathode, lithium sulfide, split into elemental sulfur and lithium ions. Yeah. Um, the lithium ions migrate through an electrolyte membrane to the anode, where they take up electrons and become uncharged lithium atoms, which are then bound into an alloy by tin nanoparticles. And the process is reversible, so it can be charged again and again. 
So they've got a specific energy of about 1.1 kilowatt hours per kilogram, which really blows all these lithium metal-free batteries into the weeds. So this could be the power source of choice for EV applications. Well, those are some pretty exciting developments, Calvin. Um, and uh, and I, I know you've got a few more stories. Um, maybe, maybe we can save them for next time. Yeah, I'm or, running out of time now, aren't I? Yeah, or, um, or people can also um, check out more. No doubt you'll be um, have, talking about this kind of stuff over at uh, The Geek Show. Yeah, well, I'm writing all this up um, into a piece in the next couple of days. So I'd, uh, if, if anyone's following me out there on Twitter or on Facebook... Um, or at the Geek Show, uh, something should be out in the next couple of days. I've got a lot of research I did for this, and it it just makes for an excellent article. Cool. Twitter.com forward slash Calvin, C-H-E-L-F-Y-N, or thegeekshow.com, two threes rather than two E's. Until next time, Calvin. Okay, cheers.